our next speaker is Sean McKee. He, besides being the director for the center uh, for today, he's also a research scientist uh, from the physics department, and he works on high energy physics. But today he's going to talk about the Osiris project that uh, early, Eric Michelson introduced earlier today. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to give you an overview of one of the related projects um, that actually is exploring the foundations that the center was actually put together on. This is OSIRIS. It stands for Open Storage Research Infrastructure. And we have um, nice collaboration between the three main research institutions in the state of Michigan, Indiana University. This is funded by the National Science Foundation. And we are actually participating as part of the CEPH open source software project. So this is a five-year pilot program to really understand how to do multi-institutional storage, getting across boundaries either within campuses or between campuses. Um, and it's based on using uh, Ceph and software-defined networking to couple an infrastructure together that can be used across multiple institutions in a common way. So the goal here is really to have an infrastructure that can meet, say, 80% of the different use cases that science runs into when trying to do things with large, distributed, or diverse data, and trying to bring lots of scientists together to extract scientific value from that data. Um, and the advantage for institutions is that if that is true, if you can solve most of the big uh, storage requirements for multi-institutional science with a common infrastructure, you benefit just can build wide on one platform that meets most of the needs of the scientists on your campus. So that's what we're actually exploring with OSIRIS. To what extent can we provide an infrastructure that can do that? So a um, high level overview, um, you can see our three institutions, Michigan State, Wayne State, University of Michigan. Um, the red lines that are shown here are what's currently in place in terms of the network. We have two 40 gig gigabit per second network links that go between Michigan State and the University of Michigan, and then two 10 gig links that connect from Michigan State and U of M to Wayne State. So the network's a little unbalanced, but we've just this summer purchased some additional equipment to bring up new 100 gig component that will serve this infrastructure. So we'll have 100 gig links that go between all three. We will keep the pink lines as well. And the software-defined networking that I mentioned is actually part of being able to use that network capability to serve both the needs of the infrastructure and the needs of the science domains. Um, we're currently running a Ceph cluster that's actually distributed across all three sites. We're running MIMIC, uh, version 13.2.1 of Ceph. Um, we currently have about 600 OSD, uh, basically disks, that store data for Ceph. Um, and five petabytes of raw storage. But that's in the process of being upgraded. We'll have about 840 OSD and about 7.4 petabytes in the next two months. Um, I'll talk a little bit in a future slide about the network topology work that we're doing. We basically need to visualize what's available and monitor it so that we understand all the network paths that exist. And then we have to have ways to actually control those network paths, both for the infrastructure and for the science domain. Um, we've got a special uh, component that we've just added to OSIRIS uh, during the last year. Van Andel Research Institute in Grand Rapids has joined as one of our sites. And we've put a caching infrastructure in place there um, so that collaborators at Van Andel are working with Michigan State or in principle U of M or Wayne State um, have local caching capability that we provide through OSIRIS. So when they need data, it initially can come there, and then this cache can serve as a local point where you can work on the data, and then in the background, sync the data back. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a future slide as well. Um, this is sort of the site overview. All three sites, the sites at University of Michigan and Wayne State and Michigan State, have very similar infrastructure in place. Um, there are client services, so this is the science-facing component. This is how people get access to OSIRIS. Underlying it, there are a bunch of support services, monitoring, um, availability, um, configuration management, provisioning, et cetera. And then we have the individual components that comprise the storage infrastructure itself. So the storage node with the OSDs underneath the disks that are actually used to store data, um, the metadata server, um, a monitor, 
And then Indiana is working with us closely on the whole networking part. So we want to use software-defined networking to help orchestrate the system to optimize the quality of service for the, for the science users. And so there's a number of pieces to this. They've developed um, a product called Periscope, and it's based on Unis, which builds a model of network topology and discovers it through various mechanisms. And then a flange application that can actually enable open flow or software-defined networking rules that we can put in place. Um, so the core um, Ceph infrastructure is basically the same at each site, though there is a different number of storage nodes, different number of OSDs, depending on which site. Any site can be used for S3, um, basically object access to the data. Any site can be used as a Globus endpoint. So we can collaborate with people outside of the OSIRIS institutions using Globus to move data in or out of the system and provide access to remote collaborators and other institutions. Um, also, users at each site can, NF, can mount NFS exports using Ganesha and the Ceph file system abstraction layer. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this because this is one of our challenges we have to provide each institution the ability to have clients that can see the data and make sense to the user at that institution. Um, these are some of the technical details um, in terms of the actual hardware that we're using. Um, this represents sort of one site. There are four main components. There is a, as I mentioned, a Globus Online do node that's used uh, as a data transfer node. Um, it's connected with two 25 gig connections into the local infrastructure. We started out with Dell R630 servers, one use servers there. We also have perf sonar measurement nodes, and these are extended with that periscope capability that I talked about. So in addition to doing the standard perf sonar testing of the network, we can also uh, extend that box to also discover information about the network. And that gives us visibility into what's possible between this location and other locations in the network. The bottom right corner is our virtualization component. We have two nodes for redundancy. All the Ceph services we need are virtualized, and we can run them on this highly available platform. In addition, we have the capability of augmenting what the science domains need by running up special VMs that can do science domain-specific activities. This could be related to data lifecycle management. This could be related to something that the science domain needs to effectively use the storage. We're kind of open on this, and it's one of the features that we can provide to a science domain when we understand what their needs and use cases are. And then this part over here is the real storage. So we have a storage node. We currently have anywhere from three to five nodes at each site. Uh, we're planning to scale up to sort of of order 10 nodes by the end of the project. And the idea is you have a 2U head node, well connected, four 25 gig links into the local infrastructure, and then 60 disks in basically a JBOD chassis with resilient connections. And these can then be added on. You can go more and more of these to add more storage. Um, in this year's purchase, we've gone from the 8 terabyte disk that we started out with in here to now all 10 terabyte disks. And we've added some additional new PCI and VME devices to serve the caching model. Um, here's a quick overview of some of the parameters. For Ceph, you have to worry about how much memory and processing power you have per disk that you're serving. Um, so it's important there are certain rules of thumb that we tried to meet here. Um, and in many cases, we were close. Ideally, you would have at least one hyper-threaded core per disk. So we have 60 disks, and we have 56 cores. We're slightly under, but that's OK. At startup, we do see 100% usage. And then that ramps down to sort of, in normal use cases, about 20 to 30% of the CPU is used. Um, in terms of memory, we would like to have something like a gigabyte per terabyte. We're not quite there, um, but the system is working pretty well for the workflows that we're currently running on. Um, we have NVMe devices that serve as write logs or databases for BlueStore, which is a technology that Ceph has developed internally to store the data that Ceph needs about the objects that are stored. Um, this is about 1% of the block device space. Recommendations for Ceph are anywhere from 1% to 4%. We're a little bit on the low end. But again, there's a big cost in, in making these larger, adding more of these. So we've our limitation in all of these cases is that we couldn't quite meet the recommendations, but we tried to balance with the resources that we had to give us good performance. The cache tier actually has three nodes. Each has an 11 terabyte NVMe device in it. And then there are four. These are carved up into four OSDs, four virtual disks inside the NVMe device. And this is running an AMD EPIC 
uh, hardware platform, um, which gives us good I.O. capabilities. Um, there's a number of science domain users that we already have. I mentioned Van Andel before. Um, this is a collaboration between MSU um, and Van Andel um, in terms of Cyrus usage. This is bioinformatics research data. And basically, OSIRIS is the platform that allows the researchers at Van Andel and Michigan State to work closely together. A lot of the computational resources that they need are at MSU's ICER. And so OSIRIS allows them to have visibility both from the compute side at MSU and from the scientists at Van Andel. The US Naval Research Laboratory is um, using OSIRIS to host a lot of their data. They have these big 3D physical ocean models they generate on DOD computers. When they generate those big models, those are proprietary for 30 days. The Navy keeps them for their internal use. But then they're happy to let physical ocean researchers anywhere in the world use them. The problem is most people can't get an account on a DOD computer. So what they do is they move it over to OSIRIS, and then we serve as a platform for researchers in Europe and Asia and across the US to look at this data. Um, and they're currently storing a couple hundred terabytes They'd like to sort of get more into the petabyte scale because their models are going to higher resolution. As we heard earlier with Allison's um, atmospheric talk, ocean models are doing the same thing, finer resolution, uh, finer time steps. Um, I'm a physicist from the ATLAS experiment, and ATLAS is one of the users of OSIRIS. Um, we're actually using OSIRIS um, a little differently than these other two. We're actually using it, I guess, fundamentally is what Ceph is built to do, which is as an object store. So think of a URL that you could read or write. Each URL is an object. There's no real file system in this case. There's just some sort of structure to the URL that you can arbitrarily assign. And that's your lookup for the thing that you store. So Atlas is using something called an event service. We simulate or analyze individual events that happen when particles collide. And each one of them can be stored as a thing, as an object, and um, can be sourced or sank from OSIRIS. So the idea is for high performance computing centers where we can get access to, we're sort of backfill jobs. So they have many, many, they need to say, coast schedule 64,000 processors for a big complicated parallel job. While they're clearing out those 64,000 cores, we can be running individual event analysis on each of those cores. And then when they finally get them clear, they just kill all our jobs and they run their big complicated coordinated task, and we don't care because when they kill us, we lost one event on each of those jobs, right? Meanwhile, we've run hundreds of thousands of events on each of those cores. So this is an interesting use case that we've been building for a while in Atlas. Um, here at University of Michigan, um, there's an NS NIH five-year project, the effect of the placental epigenome on stunning and a longitudinal African cohort. Um, this is actually using OSIRIS to store and share data with the broader community. This is a very common use case, as you might be able to see so far as we've gone through these. Putting, having um, a location that can provide visibility and access to the data is very important for a lot of these science domains. At Wayne State, there is a microscopy, imaging, and cytometry resource. Um, they're actually using it in a very similar way. Their data that they get from microscopes, they're making available to broader communities to jointly work on the data. There's a project called Jetscape, which is an NSF-funded multi-institutional effort. There is actually 11 institutions in here, and Wayne State is the lead. Um, they're designing event simulations for ultra-relativistic heavy ion collisions, so sort of somewhere between nuclear and high-energy physics. And OSIRIS is actually providing the storage platform both for their codes and for their simulation runs to share with the broader collaboration. Um, Global Night Lights at University of Michigan is the only complete archive of the NOAA nighttime imagery from two different satellite programming programs spanning from one from 1993 to 2016 and the other one from 2012 and is still ongoing. And they keep portions of their archive in OSIRIS to allow people all over the world to have access to this data. Um, I showed you all the science domains. For each one of them, when we bring them into OSIRIS, we have a fairly complicated set of things we need to do. We need to enable them to access and use the storage. One of the things we also have to do is enable them to sort of define who their members are, who has read, write, delete privilege, all of that. 
Um, so one of the first things we have to do is come up with workflows that create their initial storage locations. Um, we're using common tools. Um, we're using Internet 2's co-manage and other tools related to authorization and identity, Shibboleth and common, Edugain. And the whole point here is that we don't want to reinvent that whole thing of, oh, here's your new username and password. Everybody should be able to use their institutional identity and access the storage. And based on institutional identity, we have to allow each of these science domains to define who are their members at these multiple institutions that are working together and what privileges they have. So this workflow is really about getting the initial provisioning in place as we bring on board a new science domain. Then there's also the challenge that we've had for a while. If you think about it, you have your identity at the University of Michigan. You're working with collaborators, let's say, at Wayne State and Michigan State on a science project. And each of you have a UID and a GID in your local institution. And it could be the same or different from UIDs and GIDs that are at these other institutions. What we need to do is provide a mapping service, a way to say, ah, here is your identity within the VO, and here is your identity at your institution. We have to make sure that when they store data in OSIRIS, in our science domain, that it's represented appropriately for their tools that they're using to do their science. So I'd like to see if I create a file that is owned by me. And I'd like to be a Wayne State to know that it's also owned by me. They have to look it up. So the me in this part is the central part that OSIRIS keeps. And we keep mappings then with each of the institutions. And it's fairly complicated to actually make that work for all the different ways that a client might access, mount, or use OSIRIS. So this is a bit of an eye chart, but it has some of the complexity that we have to deal with. Um, we've been trying to provide CephFS, which is the Ceph POSIX file system-like view of the storage um, for clients. And we have a challenge in that clients could be your laptop, your workstation, or your big computing cluster, and they can all run different versions of software. And it can be a challenge to provide an easy toolkit that lets us map for any of these users their identity and their access onto their local resources. So we have some challenges here. We've been trying to do some things. This is very similar to what NFS v4 actually has to deal with. NFS v4 can work across multiple domains, and you have identity that needs to be shared and, and transformed. And we tried a number of different things, like creating a fuse mount on local clusters or local systems. And then we had issues, problems with permission or things not working exactly correct. And we're not experts in fuse mounts or these underlying um, file system things. We've come up right now with a way to actually do most of what we need to do. Um, security relies on UID, GID restriction to these Ceph access keys. And so that's the mapping we currently have. It's a bit of an ugly hack. We're continuing to work on a more generic solution that we hope we'll be able to use uh, in the near future. That Ceph cache tier that I mentioned at Van Andel, it actually makes a big difference. Um, here's some examples. Over here on this axis is the bandwidth in megabytes per second for accessing the data. Um, this is right here is about 450 megabytes. Once we put a cache tier in, in front of the data, you can see that here we're hitting almost 1.3 gigabytes per second with the cache tier. So it makes a very large difference to have that cache tier here. Um, this is an example of the way the cache works is basically we tell it how much of the cache to use before it has to worry about flushing it out to the remote disks at the other institutions. And so um, you can see a little bit of the impact. This is the point in the throughput where we had to start back flushing the data out. And you can see a slight drop here, but then it was constant. Um, so this caching ratio, we've got a bunch of parameters that we can use, has actually been very effective to help the scientists get good performance. And this is sort of part of what we have to do at each institution as well. If you have a science domain that has most of their users at U of M and only a couple at Wayne State, you might want to store a lot of the data at U of M and have more caching disks at the remote sites where there's a smaller number of users. Um, and we have that in our toolkit for customizing this infrastructure. Um, I did mention all the networking things uh, early on. 
Um, this is a little bit about flange and open flow. Open flow is a technology used in software-defined networking. Um, that's not really a standard, but at least it has some well-defined components. Um, the whole idea here is being able to orchestrate how information moves through the network. So Ceph is, is a very nice um, system for many reasons. One of them is that it self-heals. If you lose a server, you lose a disk, it automatically recognizes that fact and will move data around on the remaining resources to make sure that you have the same level of resiliency and that everything is repaired automatically. The problem is when a server or a rack or even a few disks go away, they can generate a lot of traffic. We have very high performance links and that moving of data can interfere with the scientists actually trying to access the infrastructure. So what we're trying to do is get visibility into the network, understand all the different physical paths that exist between the science users and between the Ceph deployments themselves, and orchestrate the traffic so that they go on different paths. The way that networking usually works is you have a router that figures out that's the path. You're going to that location, you take that path. What we're trying to say is, oh, you're going to that location, but you're this science domain. You go on this path. Oh, you're Ceph and you're self-healing you go on this path. So the first part of it is, of course, getting the information about what paths exist. And the second part is then being able to manage and orchestrate those paths. And OpenFlow uh, is basically extensively, it came from Google. They had to manage all their own internal network links. Um, and they pushed the technology a lot. Um, it's still not quite production ready, in my mind. Um, but over the next few years, um, it's going to be more and more production ready. And so we're trying to make sure that we have the tools, the hooks, everything in place to be able to do that orchestration. Um, a lot of our challenges have actually been related to the network. When you take a Ceph cluster and you stretch it across three institutions, anything bad happens to the network, um, we can notice it very quickly. Um, we've seen periods where, because of Ceph healing, the link to Wayne State, the 10 gigabit link, is saturated flat. 10 gigabits. <laughs> so um, it can even be worse if instead of losing a network connection, we have a network connection that's flaky and faulty because then it causes the Ceph monitors to go up and down. It causes abortive attempts at healing that come, go, come, go. Um, so a lot of our issues that we've seen in running this distributed infrastructure have pointed back to the network. So for now, you know, certainly having the persona infrastructure in place, being able to figure out when there are network problems and point to where they are. That's very useful. In the longer term, we want to use this idea that we can orchestrate the network and monitor it so that we could ourselves programmatically move around such bottlenecks. So when we lose a link or a link is faulty, we just move traffic off from it using other possible paths. And so that's one of the goals of OSIRIS is to come up with ways of, of doing that effectively. Um, we're just starting our fourth year. It's a five-year project. Um, we'll have 7.4 petabytes soon. For year four, we're going to be focused on a few different things. We're going to be integrating two more OSIRIS science domains, one in bioinformatics and one in aquatic biogeochemistry. We'll continue to augment, improve, and harden the client toolkit that we have so it's easier for us to support multiple different types of clients that we run across. We want to get this OSIRIS network orchestration in place in production. We already have test bed use of it and it's, it's basically at the point where we need to make progress, we need to actually start putting it into use within OSIRIS. Um, and we'd also like to start looking at um, experimenting with different sub pool configurations to better support different science domain use cases. Um, in particular, Atlas is interested in a product called Dcache, which was developed as a disk cache in front of big tape systems, a hierarchical storage management system. Um, the Dcache currently manages all the disks. Ceph can do it much better. So the idea is we would like to have Ceph behind our Dcache, and so we will carve out some pools in OSIRIS and see how they actually behave. Atlas and the WLCG experiments have some big challenges coming up in about 10 years, and the concept of data lakes, which I didn't go into, is, is something uh, that we have to address, and this is part of that research. There's also a new NSF-funded project in the U.S. called the Open Storage Network. The PI is Alex Saleh at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I actually went to their kickoff meeting a couple weeks ago. We're planning to collaborate with them, so we're going to carve out about a petabyte of storage um, out of OSIRIS, and it'll be one of the OSN 
storage locations around the US. And this project is, is something that's sort of previewing some of the technologies needed for a potential national research platform. Um, so these are things coming up. Um, I think the project itself is progressing well. We're supporting numerous science communities. Uh, we've been surprised that more of the science domains haven't been focused on OSIRIS to provide really the thing that they complained about initially, which was the fact that you have to move data to the compute, do something, and move results back. And that was one of the things that OSIRIS was really focused on. But as I showed you, many of the science use cases tend to use it to enable a broader community to share and easily access the data, rather than compute on the data directly. Though we have some work in that area. Um, there's a number of research areas that we're going to be exploring, the Ceph optimization in use, additional network monitoring that we need to provide the visibility that we need, and ultimately the orchestration. And then really just ease of use for the science domains and how they use this infrastructure. So I think I will stop there and see if there are any questions. Thanks. This is maybe a little bit off uh, the the thrust of this pre presentation, but would you be willing to talk a little bit about um, how implementing co-manage went for you and provisioning groups and stuff like that? I've tried to get people interested in co-manage and it's hard to get people to bite on it, I think. Yeah, I, so I would say that we, we definitely had some challenges and we tested out the product early on. I don't know, Ben, if you want to say to me. Yeah, one or two. Right, plugins to provide all, all of what we do with CoManage is centered around the plugins that we've written that provision to Ceph. And I find that to be a very useful infrastructure. Um, uh, yeah, I think the combination of CoManage and Grouper has, has really enabled us to do this. Um, it is pretty core to, to how the project works and how it provisions new users. Any more questions? How long is the, the data allowed to be stored in the OSIRIS system? Is there a sunset time for that, or is it just a perpetual so use? It's a five-year project, and it's really viewed as a pilot project. We're trying to run it in a DevOps mode. We need to develop well. Science domains want to use it for production, so we're, we're aware of that. What we've told the science domains is that we will give them a certain amount of storage, and they can have that and maybe more as long as the project exists. So it's free storage. What we asked the science domains to do was provide us with a half an FTE of somebody who knows how they do their science. Because we frequently have to iterate with them on the best way for them to take advantage of the storage we give them. Right? So many of the science domains want like a POSIX file system want it mounted everywhere. And some of the science domains actually could benefit much better from using the object store interface. So there's a conversation that happens there. But we don't put a, a lifetime on the data. But the fact is that once the project ends, after five years, um, we did in the proposal write that the goal was to transition this to each institution. So each of our institutions has said, if this is useful for our scientists, we will continue to maintain the infrastructure beyond the project. So ultimately, there may be some charge back to, you know, these disks have to be replaced at some point, the servers have to be maintained, et cetera, et cetera. But for now, we don't charge them, and they have it till the end of the project, and we start them out with a certain amount, and we can increase it as we expand the system. So for another year? Um, two years. Two years. Basically, we're just starting year four and year five. Though we do have a review coming up next spring that decides if they will unlock the fifth year of funding for us. Okay. This is one of the big projects where you have an 18-month review and a 36 So as an IT person, this seems to me like something that would generate tremendous interest and tremendous growth. If, if I heard you right, you said so far it's generated perhaps a little less than you were expecting. I, I, 
you know, basically I thought that the pull of here's free storage, we can give you a few hundred terabytes. Everybody was interested in that up front. And having the aspect that you could compute on that, those two things together we thought would be much more of a pull. When it comes down to it, everybody is busy. And using the resource, as, as Allison mentioned earlier, you know, getting the people actually to do the work is a bigger challenge maybe than the fact that we're giving them lots of storage that's accessible and usable. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a little, so I, I thought there would be a bigger uh, uptake. This is a pie in the sky suggestion, but um, it looks like so far you're doing physics data and biomedical data too, for example. Um, send a representative to do a talk at one of their giant meetings is you know, basically a marketing approach. Does that seem, at least in theory, like a, something that could be done? An another thing to do is maybe have a symposium like this where we bring people in. I was also just talking to Allison idea. about using it for the uh, atmospheric data. There's some interest there. So yeah, things like this and getting the word out really helps. Okay. Thank you. So um, wearing a couple of hats here. One of them is is that um, to just to strengthen what Sean said. As as Arc, we committed to, um, to to looking at this seriously as one of the portfolio of storage that we would offer as part of the sustainability and part of our interest of being and cutting edge on on storage. Um, the other thing I w I would strengthen what Sean said, um, wearing the hat of involvement with Osiris, I mean, some of it has to do with the fact that this is more than people want free storage, they want free, I, I just don't want to even figure out how to use it, storage. My student is not going to become a Ceph expert. And even if they don't need to become a Ceph expert, they they view that as that. And then the third the third way of looking at it is that Osiris was meant to be, I mean, as in anything that is funded as a paradigm kind of um, proposal, it's meant to to figure out along the way. It's an experiment. It's meant to figure out lots of things. And, and one of the things may be that the bar may be high and there needs to be a focus on making the bar lower. So, so you have to look at it as an experiment as opposed to the to storage offerings that are mature and that we offer to campus. Any more questions? Okay. okay. So uh, let's thank Sean again. <laughs>